Um, hello. I am David Stewart. Has every, do I have to start from the very beginning talking about chemsex? <laughs> okay, first of all, I'm not sure if I'm in the right place. I need your help to tell me if I'm in the right place. There's a conference happening over at Dublin Castle at the moment, which is a gay men's health conference, and the highest, most highly prioritised topic on the agenda there is chemsex. Any HIV or sexual health conference in the world at the moment, the most discussed topic would be chemsex. It's a big public health concern, and I'll try to explain why. But whenever I speak to substance misuse sector conferences, nobody knows what it is. So I'll need your help. Let me talk for a little while, and then you can help me at the end figure out if I'm in the right place or not. I hope I am. <laughs> um, so I'll put chemsex into context first. Chems for chemicals, chems and sex. It's using drugs for sex, and that's nothing new. Let me, let me, I think I'll try to explain kind of what it is, a definition if you like. I'm not using slides, by the way. Um, so I think when someone uses heroin or crack cocaine, they don't do it to, out, to go out and have a laugh or to, out to have a good time. You know, th those drugs have a very distinct purpose and different drugs are used for different purposes. And it's usually, uh, well you know better than me, but usually about nursing some historical trauma or numbing a little. It's not so much something that you would do to engage or socialise or go out and laugh and connect. It's quite often an isolating high that people are looking for. Um, Gay men have not preferred those drugs historically. They've always preferred the party drugs. So if you picture the stereotype of the gay men, it's usually things, using things like ecstasy and cocaine and MDMA. Pretty low problematic drugs, really. Um, and they're drugs that facilitate connection and community. And that's part, probably because, I don't know, if you're the only gay in the family or the only gay in the, uh, at school or the only gay in the village, um, that can be an isolating kind of isolating, lonely kind of experience. So if you're going to use a drug, it wouldn't be one that isolates you further, like heroin or crack cocaine might. You want to pick something that's more socialised and that facilitates connection, community. And so picture the stereotype of the gay man with his shirt off and a community of other gay men on a dance floor, perhaps. And they were very commonly used drugs for sex as well. So gay men used ecstasy, cocaine and MDMA in very large numbers, according to some studies, 10 times more than their heterosexual counterparts, um, for sex as well as dancing and other stuff, quite a lot. But I guess during those years, I'm talking about the 1980s, 1990s and the early 2000s, when those drugs were the most commonly used drugs by gay men, we didn't see a lot of gay men rushing to A&E departments with overdoses. We didn't see people rushing to A&E departments with withdrawal symptoms. We didn't see them going to addiction <coughs> services saying, help me with my ecstasy addiction. We didn't, see, um, gay men, we didn't see larger numbers of gay men injecting drugs. We didn't see drug-induced psychoses in large numbers. And most importantly, in regard to chemsex, we didn't see large numbers, well, high rises, higher rises in HIV or sexually transmitted infections relating to those drugs. It was pretty cute and fluffy work working with gay men and drugs in my day when I used to work in a drug service just with um, LGBT people. But about 2000, early 2000s, something, well, a few things were changing really dramatically. It was a cultural shift. And chemsex is not just about new drugs, it's about a syndemic or a, a, a syndemic of different behaviours all happening at the same time, just behaviour but things, circumstances happening at the same time. So in one sense, HIV epidemic was in full swing. It's been a traumatic 30 years for gay communities around the world and others. But um, <coughs> while HIV care was getting better, HIV prevention was getting more complicated. So there is, uh, I'm sure you all know, I, hope don't, I'll, I will just summarise, there is PEP, which is if you, become, if you get an accidental infection of HIV, you can take a medicine which will prevent you most likely from catching the infection. Um, there is treatment as prevention, which means if, you, if you're HIV positive, you can take a medicine which pretty much guarantees your viral load makes you undetectable, so you can't transmit the virus even without a condom. And that's providing you're going to bed with someone that you know they're taking their medicines properly. If you're getting confused already, imagine what it's like for a gay man. It's not just a condom that you need in regard to HIV prevention or transmission anymore. It's a whole load of skills to go to bed with someone, to be able to have the conversation about HIV, navigate your way through the stigma, which medicines you're on, which medicines your partner might be on or not, whether to go and get PEP or not, whether they're taking their medicines every day and they are infectious. That's a lot of stuff to go to bed with. 
<coughs> HIV prevention was getting more complicated as the care was getting better. And throughout those years of the AIDS epidemic, we did teach gay men really well that their sex lives were associated with risk and danger. We taught them that, they took it on board, and they took it into their bedrooms with them. And, and that's a good thing, I think, but it might have had some consequences as well. <coughs> so around 2005, that was one thing that was changing. HIV prevention was getting more complicated. But another thing happened around then too, it was new technology. Suddenly, Grindr and apps like that on our phones completely changed the way gay men hook up and find sex. In some cases, it had been going uh, cottaging in public toilets and parks, uh, or it had been back in the day, in, uh, if you were tall like me and you could sneak into the newsagent to the sh reach the top shelf and steal a gay magazine because he wouldn't buy it, it's too embarrassing, and find where your gay bar is, you'd go there. Might have black painted windows. I'm older than I look, just by the way. Um, Grindr and the other apps, Gaydar and things like that, changed all. With your GPS satellite navigating stuff, you can find someone really close to you, five minutes away, We're using an avatar that says uh, you are hot and fit and available right now, and before you know it, you're in bed with a complete stranger. Wow, great. But this new technology didn't come with an instruction booklet. It didn't sort of help this population of people that were already traumatised by an HIV epidemic to, and you know, taking risk and danger into the bedrooms with them. It didn't come with an instruction booklet to help them understand their sexual and emotional needs and to communicate it on those online platforms using abbreviated terms and 140 characters and a picture of a perfect torso to sell themselves. So sex was getting really complicated for gay men and at the same time that this technology was changing things and making it more complicated and HIV was making things more complicated, three new drugs landed in the laps of gay men in San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, Melbourne, Sydney, Cape Town, London, Berlin, Dublin, yeah, Copenhagen, places you wouldn't expect. Three new drugs being crystal methamphetamine, mephedrone and GHB GBL. And again, like Grindr didn't come with an instruction booklet of how to use it well to have more satisfying, productive, emotionally aware sex. These drugs didn't come with an instruction booklet either. So these guys who had normalised things like ecstasy and cocaine to facilitate community and to provide connection, found these new drugs to do the same thing. But they were a lot more harmful. So around this time, early 2000s, suddenly with these new drugs, new technologies, we suddenly saw gay men rushing to accident and emergency departments with overdoses, with withdrawal symptoms. We saw larger, game, uh, larger numbers of gay men injecting drugs. In fact, according to Public Health England, more gay men are injecting drugs than ever before in recorded history. We did see more gay men going to drug services, looking for seeking help with addiction problems and, and support. But in regard to chemsex, most importantly, we saw rises in HIV infections and other sexually transmitted infections, phenomenal rises. And that's chemsex. A typical chemsex situation would be um, hooking up on Grindr, Maybe some of you have heard of chemsex parties. I don't know what you picture when you hear that, but a chemsex party is not like you get uh, an invitation in the post and, and you put your tie on and you buy a bottle of wine, you go to someone's house, knock on the door and you go in and you have like sex, like in a 70s style orgy. It's not quite like that. It's more like sort of looking, hooking up on your phone and finding a partner, going to have sex with them. There's some drugs there. Or maybe it's going to a bar. Somebody gives you um, a line of methadone. Before you know it, you're in a sauna. These drugs have long half-lives. I don't know and they work differently. If anyone has in the room has ever had sex on ecstasy, you don't have to put your hand up. <laughs> but I have, and it's, I just licked the pillow for a couple of hours or told my whole life story to a complete stranger. I didn't have rampant sex that lasts for three days, always looking for more, sort of accessing my sexual appetite and accessing some sexual disinhibition. These three drugs, crystal methamphetamine, mephedrone and G, they do that very differently. They're characterized very differently and they have very different effects. So a typical presentation that we would see would be somebody staying awake for two or three days using, poly using any one of these drugs that they could get, um, buying them or getting them from friends on the internet. You don't need a real life social network uh, of friends to find a dealer. You can just log on and have them within 10 minutes. So it normalized drug use to a population that had already normalized another kind of drug use. And it tapped into something that gay men were needing, problems around their sex lives and their sexual intimacy needs. So I work at 5016 Street, but I used to work at a drug service in central London. 
And I saw more of these trends happening back around 2005. And I went to my nearest clinic in 2010, which was 5016 Street, where I work now. It's a sexual health and HIV clinic. And I popped in there and I said, are you seeing more of this chemsex stuff? And they said, what's chemsex? I thought, oh God, do I have to do that again? <laughs> um, but I told them and they said, oh yeah, these drugs. Yes, we have actually, yes. We've seen a lot more gay men using these drugs. Thank you. We think we're on top of it, but let's hook up and, and see if we can improve care. But yes, we are aware and we think we've got our performers and everything in place. That, that happened to be on the Thursday before a bank holiday weekend. I went back on the Tuesday after the bank holiday to their PEP clinic where they dispense PEP medicines to people that have had an accidental exposure to HIV through perhaps condomless sex. And 33 people showed up for PEP that day. That's pretty common for us. We, diet, we prescribe about 30 PEPs per day at 5016 Street. Now on that day, I asked the nurses to ask the questions differently. Not just do you use illicit drugs or are you an injecting drug user, but do you use party drugs for sex sometimes with a big smile on their face? What's your favorite one? Are you having a good time? At the end of the day, 33 people showed up for PEP that day, all gay men, and every single one had come from a chemsex situation. 100% of them. That was when the clinic said, gosh, but we didn't, have, we, this is not what we thought three days ago. This is a lot worse. We thought chemsex wasn't that big a problem because people weren't coming into our service saying, hey, hand up, help me with chemsex, please. That's not how you identify a new trend like this. They were coming in with the consequences, gonorrhea, wanting an HIV test, needing PEP. None of them disclosing that they were using drugs unless we asked them in the right way. And that's how we identified this chemsex phenomenon, which is now responsible for... Uh, let me tell you what it's responsible for. I know we've got some people from HIV Ireland in the room. <coughs> the way HIV epidemiology works in gay communities around the world, in all those cities I mentioned, is let's say a gay man catches HIV. Let's say he caught HIV five weeks ago. It doesn't matter how he caught it. Three weeks later, he comes to a clinic to get a test. It shows up negative because the window period requires between four to six weeks to get a positive result. So he's positive, zero converting, but he thinks he's negative. He goes, yeah, maybe he's, he does chemsex. Next weekend, he's on his grinder, going around, having sex with between three, 15 people over the course of a three or four day period, most likely not using condoms while in the grip of this incredible high and sort of acting out sexually. Um, He's zero converting, so the symptoms of that might be a rash or a fever or cold or sweating. He's not going to notice those symptoms because they're the same as some of the drugs. It's also quite similar to the come down you would have from missing two or three days sleep and doing a whole lot of really heavy drugs. And he's going to transmit HIV to all the other HIV negative people that he sees over the course of those two or three days, which could be between two and 15 people according to what the trends we're seeing at Dean Street. And then each one of them the following week, go through the same process. That's how we think HIV epidemiology is happening in all the big cities around the world because we thought PEP would stop the rising infections of HIV when it was introduced about 10 years ago. We thought treatment as prevention, having most of the HIV positive men in London who know they're HIV positive, and it's probably the same in Dublin, um, have undetectable viral loads. If they have sex, with you, without a condom, they can't transmit the virus to you. So it's acute infections, meaning it's the guy who caught it just a few weeks ago. He hasn't been tested or diagnosed yet, he hasn't been put on treatment, he's still infectious and going to chemsex parties. And that's pretty much what we think is happening with HIV. So let's say, why, is this a sexual health problem or is it a drug problem? Why am I in the right, at the right conference today or not? If there's, two, if there's two men sitting in the waiting room of one of your drug services, one of them is a heterosexual male, um, street homeless, heroin injector, hepatitis C positive. You're brilliant people. You will identify at risk there very easily. He'll tick all the right boxes for high risk, I think, and you'll know that he's possibly going to transmit hepatitis C through sharing needles. Um, and in regard to public health cost, um, the care for that individual is probably, you know, quite up about thousands of euros a year to provide the treatment to help that person. Now, next to him is a gay man. He's HIV negative. He's hep C negative. He's not street homeless. He owns his own home. He's got a partner, a boyfriend and a job. He's only using recreational drugs, not injecting. And he's only doing it twice a month. I don't know how many high risk boxes he's going to tick for you. I know you're, you're great workers. You'll provide great care for that person but he's not going to tick all the high-risk boxes. But in a sexual health clinic, 
we'll ask certain questions and we'll know that he's, we'll find out whether he's having, how many people he's having sex with and whether he's using condoms or not. According to our algorithms and to, regarding the HIV prevalence within the population of the people he's having sex with, he's going to catch HIV within the next three to six months. It's guaranteed. Not only that, but he's going to transmit it to perhaps 30 to 60 or more within the next six months to a year. The public health cost there is in the millions per year. And yet he might not have been ticking all those high risk boxes in your thing. In our clinic, we'll make sure that if he needs PEP, because we'll ask his questions if he's had any unprotected sex, and we'll prescribe it for him on the spot without any referrals or sending to another service. If he is HIV positive and he's taking medicines, we've got the doctors on site to know if the drugs, the medicines, HIV medicines he's on, are interacting with the drugs he's taking and causing a more likely to have an overdose, drug-drug interactions. We've got all the right all the right care on site to be doing that. I mentioned that I worked at a drug service and I then went to work at 5016 Street, the sexual health clinic, to address it there. I now work at 5016 Street. We have 3,000 gay men coming through our doors every month that are using those three drugs. 3,000 a month. The drug service I used to work for, which is only a five minute walk from 5016 Street, has seen three gay men in the last two years using those drugs. Why? Huh? Well, I it's up to you to answer. Right. I would say that, that's it. Because no, we're, nobody's identifying chemsex in the world by gay men coming forward saying, help me with chemsex. We've got a population of people that have normalised drug use to see it as a practical, helpful tool in their social lives, normalised, completely socially acceptable. A nurse working in one of our clinics uh, in our Dean Street Express clinic, we see 500 people through that clinic every day. So a nurse there, a young female nurse who probably doesn't have any gay friends, probably knows a lot more about gay sex than I do, just because of the volume of people she sees. The first guy comes in and says, hi, I was at a sauna on the weekend. I think I've got gonorrhea. I need some medicine. I was up for a couple of days. I had loads of sex with people. Actually, I passed out for a few hours too. There were still some guys in there, but I don't know what happened then, so I can't really give you the details. But um, I need my medicine, please. And the nurse is thinking, <laughs> Goodness, so many things here I want to address, like sexual well-being and uh, behavioural interventions and consent to sex is quite an issue there too. But he's like, yeah, don't, it happened last month, it'll happen next month too. Just, I need my medicine, please. It's normal for us. And she's got a queue outside, of course, the nurse. And the next one comes in needing PEP because uh, an accidental exposure to HIV. And the nurse wants to know if the person uh, involved in the infection is, uh, we need to know the status, if they're taking medicines or not, if they've got detectable viral loads. So she might ask, is the person waiting in the waiting room? Could we call them in or could we call them to find out what their status is? And the guy goes, I don't know who it was. I know the grinder name, maybe. It could be one of 10 guys. I did PEP last month. I'll probably do it next month too. I just need my PEP, please. And the nurse has still got a queue outside. 30 to 40 a day, one after the other. All very similar presentations. And although the nurses are kind of traumatised by the end of the week and go out drinking very heavily, I might add, <laughs> with my blessing to cope with all of this, um, not, none of these gay men are identifying an issue with their sex lives. And so it falls upon us to provide that intervention. Now, is it a drug intervention that they need? We're finding in England, we're I think a little more fortunate than you in the sense that we have health advisor teams in every sexual health clinic. Does anyone know if we have them in the sexual health clinics in? We do, good. What sexual health advisors do is, if you've had gonorrhea three or four times in the last six months or nine months, automatically the nurse says, do you wanna sit down and have a chat about your sex life with a health advisor? And the health advisor helps you figure out what do you want from sex? What is gonna make you enjoy it more? How do you make that happen using the apps and all these sorts of things? How can we help you have less infections and have a better sex life? That's the same thing as making an intervention around chemsex behavior. It's about somebody who understands Grindr, the normalized um, promiscuity, if you forgive the expression. Um, the risks and the normalisation within the thing and how to have a better, more happy sex life that leads to less harm. That's what the right kind of chemsex intervention is and the health advisors and clinics are really, really good at that. But they don't know how to do relapse prevention. They don't know how to help people identify triggers and manage cravings differently. They also don't know a lot about injecting techniques or when it gets much more hardcore what those acute kind of harms for that a drugs worker might need. So what the point I'm making in very little time is we need multidisciplinary 
support here. The perfect chemsex team would be a health advisor in a sexual health clinic. The nurses and doctors to do those acute risk assessments, um, PEPs and things like that. Um, preferably someone from a gay charity that knows about Grindr and gay sex that can talk to them about that. But also a drugs worker from a drug service. Preferably all, one representative from each, all in a sexual health setting where gay men like to go and talk about gay sex really easily and when they're coming with the symptoms, even if they're not ready to say, I want help with chemsex. So I think I am at the right conference. <laughs> Because I really want, the sexual health clinics are on top of this. The HIV services are on top of this. The gay men's charities are on top of this. I know because over at Dublin Castle right now, it's the high priority on their agenda. They need your help too. They need, um, I need to tell them to call you and say, yes, we'll send someone over there to be a part of that multidisciplinary team. I want you to go, yeah, I get it now because David Stewart came and gave us this really speedy lecture about it and we want to help. So that, that's it. Am I in the right place? Yeah. Yeah.